for our concluding uh, presentation, uh, we have two teams of academic researchers working across architecture, ceramic arts, and digital fabrication. Uh, ACA has always had an academic involvement in its programming, involving researchers and stu students pushing technologies and interdisciplinary collaborations. The academic teams provide opportunities to explore the craft of the material and develop new techniques that are experimental and yet, and yet to be adopted in manufacturing. The first team that will present uh, includes Professor Laura Garofalo Khan from the University of Buffalo School of Architecture and Planning, Professor Jonathan Hopp from Alfred University's Department of Ceramic Arts, and graduate student Tim Noble, a Master of Architecture candidate at the University of Buffalo. Uh, a second team called the Haptic Lab is composed of a large group of uh, faculty across uh, 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 many geographies. Uh, includes Professor uh, Linda Zhang of uh, the Ryerson University School of Interior Design, Jonathan Anderson, who's the director of the Creative Technology Lab at Ryerson School of Design, uh, Errol Willett, professor at Syracuse University School of Art, Claire Olson, professor at Cal Poly uh, College of Architecture and Environmental Design, and Naomi uh, Frangos, uh, visiting professor at Cornell University's Department of Architecture. Um, uh, so we'll have uh, um, the uh, UB uh, uh, Alfred team go first and then followed by the uh, Haptic Lab. Okay, so with that, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, both the teams. Thanks everybody for joining us here at ACAL. Um, many of us are veterans of the conference. Um, Slash workshop. Um, so this is a really interesting way of engaging our work with you guys. Um, but thanks for sticking it out to the end. Um, just a recap on the team. Um, it is myself, um, Laura Garofalo. Um, I'm an architectural professor. Jonathan Hopp teaches at um, the School of um, Ceramic Arts at Alfred and Timothy Noble, who is a, a robotic artist um, who happens to be getting a master's in architecture now. Um, our paper, uh, sorry, not paper, our project, plain as paper, um, is um, an attempt to um, look at varied um, scripted geometries uh, being um, sort of brought to life in terracotta um, using a more lightweight and less massive um, molding system, uh, particularly one made out of paper rather than uh, plaster. Um, so um, the goal of the project was to produce a mold making system um, that would be parametricized to generate multiple um, um, molds through a paper cutting system. And the goal was um, that not, none of the molds would be repetitive, um, so each one of the 20 pieces that we actually produce for the prototype um, is unique um, and one of a kind, which is very much a desire for architects and artists, um, but um, is slightly problematic when engaging manufacturing. Um, architecture and art have been um, sort of enamored with the dynamic surface um, through natural materials, um, handcrafted sculptures, like those works of Heather Knight in um, ceramics, um, and the um, sort of the very precise geometries of dynamic surfaces in tiles in Spain, like the Alhambra tiles. Um, and this has often been able to be manufactured in planar materials, such as um, the Dow canopy design shown in this slide, uh, but is more problematic when moving into um, 
actual construction materials that are massive, like terracotta. Um, and um, this sort of enamoring that nature in, with um, these types of surfaces um, has only been exacerbated by um, the use of grasshopper tools, which, prolifer which has proliferated through both the academy and practice, um, but becomes limiting in, the, um, in its range and possibilities once we move into manufacturing, in part because um, of production systems. Um, so the conventional way for architectural terracotta or architectural tiles um, to be made when they are more singular or one-off um, is to use a plaster cast um, and do a slip cast. So these slip casts um, are fantastic for cereal production, as we see in this image of um, toilet production um, at a German factory. Um, but um, they are still costly um, in terms of time and labor um, in relation to creating an entire um, sort of architectural facade system within a, um, a manageable range of cost. This does not mean that artists do not produce these kinds of systems, but it is very much a, almost like a craft. Um, so what we were looking for um, is an alternative to the sort of static serial um, uh, CNC produced um, or CNC milled form um, produced in plaster. So there are many people working with these sort of reconfigurable molds um, using plaster still that are super interesting and create really, really wonderful art pieces. Um, but we were looking for something even lighter. Um, and Jonathan Hopp has developed this very interesting um, casting system that basically uses um, paper or chipboard um, to create slip casts. Um, so as we moved into the project, we started thinking about um, what to test the system on. Um, so the main goal of the project was to produce um, the, the mold making system, um, but we needed something to test that on. So we played around with several parquet progressions and puzzle fitting sort of um, designs. Um, some were parametricized, some were done by hand. Um, these developed um, into different kinds of um, patterns and uh, structures. But what we landed upon was that we actually wanted to test it on the screen because one of the more interesting aspects of the system is that uh, surface patterning can be um, included in the mold making process. So we wanted to make something where um, not just the surface of like a tile-like structure would be shown, but also the sides of the blocks would be exposed because of this potential to color and um, design the, the um, entire surface. Um, so we wanted to exhibit that as much as possible. So we chose a prototype for a screen. It's called the C-block um, because if you turn it on its side, it which is how we started with it. It looks like a C. Um, and um, we um, created a, a set of about 90 unique different and different pieces. Um, they are unique in both elevation and section. Um, and the goal was to um, test these pieces out for precision 
accuracy and buildability of the component itself, but also of the assembly. Um, so, oh, now it's, it's there we go, sorry. Um, so we um, made it to the end, fortunately, um, with our fired pieces and our assembly um, and the C block component variations. Um, as you can see in the image on the right, there are no repetitive units at all. Um, and um, as we um, moved into this project, one of the things was that we needed to sort of prove to ourselves that this could be scaled up to an architectural scale. Um, and both in terms of efficiency, um, so could we digitally automate the mold making process because producing each one of those by hand would be very time consuming. Um, accuracy, uh, both of the mold and of the piece that um, was produced in the end, as you can see, they were sort of measured and assessed as they came out of their molds. Um, we also were looking at the depth of the component wall and the resilience of the mold making system because we are using a very a large volume of wet liquid in paper so the resilience of that system was one of the things that we were also testing for before we began to produce the prototypes so now i will hand off to jonathan hop yeah and uh, um, i'll just um outline a little bit uh, the process first um so um this system entails basically um, casting into a um, paper coated chipboard mold. Um, Laura, can you move to the next slide? So we're, um, what we're doing is, so, so plaster is really a, a phenomenal material to, to cast ceramics in. They work wonderfully together. And when you veer off that path, it, it um, instantly becomes more complex. Um, what, one of the things that the casting slip likes to do with the cardboard is just stick to it and then um, shrink um, as it's drying in the mold and then crack because it's stuck to the, to the chipboard. So one of, one of the things in this process was uh, figuring out um, a layer of paper on the cardboard for the slip to um, sort of trick the slip into sticking to the paper and then um, the paper um, um, separates from the cardboard because it's uh, glued on with a rehydratable glue. So, so um, there, there's a process of sort of printing process of applying paper and then um, another kind of bonus of this process is the ability to print on the, on the mold and then that print transferring to the casting if you print with um, materials that are high in clay content. So both glaze and underglaze can be printed on the, on the mold and the, the objects come out already, um, you know, um, um, coated or decorated and you have a lot of control over the thickness of it if you're using a silk screen as well. So these, these were two of the processes we were using uh, to prepare the material. Could you move on, Laura? And, um, then the, that material is put into the um, laser cutter and, um, you know, the, the files, um, we generate um, a flat uh, laser cutting file, cut out the material, fold up the mold, and then um, we'll cast into the mold. Next. So something's up with the slide. Yeah, so um, in, in our process, just to outline where we came to um, the necessity for a bit larger castings and the necessity for thicker castings so that, you know, I've, I've been working with this process for a while, but um, never with sort of load bearing um, pieces. So the necessity for thicker castings led us to um, double layer mold, uh, an inner mold with the uh, um, underglaze or glaze and laser etching into that glaze. And then 
um, an outer mold to support that, and then on top of that, um, corrugated um, section to um, to um, support that um, outer mold. Next slide. Um, and so um, these are a, a few of our initial tests. So the first th order of business was to check how long the casting needs to be in the mold in order to get the thickness that we wanted. Uh, so we had these several um, identical castings. Next slide. And then um, we, we did a, a range of uh, hours um, to see how long we needed um, the pieces in the mold. Next slide. And then our next order was to see what sort of strategies we wanted to keep a dimensional, um, dimensionally accurate and stable form. And so we used a cube, which is actually one of the um, more difficult forms to, to cast in this process and uh, just generally to keep sort of straight and flat in ceramics. Um, and uh, we had um, one uh, layer mold and a two layer mold, um, XY, corrugation versus radial corrugation and top uh, sort of collar to hold the uh, form in place uh, versus not having a top collar. Uh, we had a few, <laughs> quite a few, um, um, what, uh, usually you call them plaster disasters because they happen in plaster, but this was slip disaster really. Um, um, but, but we did uh, eventually land on this sort of, because of our sort of lofted forms that we were working with, uh, landed on this idea of working with a radial corrugation as it worked best with these types of forms and allowed us the most, um, the most flexibility with, with design. Next slide. Um, and then uh, another sort of point we trying to figure out is the, is the reservoir. So where you, where you would normally pour an excess of clay of casting slip um, because the mold is sucking um, moisture out of the uh, clay and, and, and the volume is going down. So you need excess when you're casting. So figuring that out and also um, how you get an enclosed block or, or form that um, is enclosed on all sides where um, uh, slip casting likes to be a hollow um, form with an opening. Um, and so these are um, um, ju just a moment after demolding our um, pieces or with the leftover paper still stuck to them and so forth. Um, and I'll, I'll um, hand over to Tim. So once we got to the, the point where um, we're working with a large variety of blocks, each of them different, it really caused us to, to rethink some of our initial assumptions about how to process these. And it pushed us more towards uh, greater automation um, because of the necessary housekeeping for all of the, the pieces. So going through the, the workflow briefly, um, the several steps that were necessary for really every piece were to deal with the scaling issues. So taking the designed uh, model and uh, applying a certain scaling, uh, in, in our case 7%, for the shrinkage that would happen later. Um, and then uh, depending on the block and its orientation, we needed to be able to orient the block itself um, within the molding system such that the reservoir was in a, a place that we could hide later and also to take advantage of the, uh, um, the, the volume that we had available in the most efficient way. Some of these blocks would not fit in our 10 by 10 by 10 um, uh, volume um, unless we oriented them. Uh, so there was a whole interface um, that, uh, um, that we had to work with to develop on that. Um, and then basically the other portion was to unroll our models um, in a way that, um, that not only kept the seams from lining up so they didn't blow out, um, we hoped not anyway, but also um, so that we could take into account the thickness of that single layer of chipboard when we go to the second layer. Um, and so things kind of started to line up. Uh, within the tolerances necessary. The other thing that, that was really important with the um, with the wooden box system that we placed all of these in was that that 
um, that that 10 by 10 by 10 volume uh, was occupied basically entirely. And, um, and the, we went from a single uh, a cradle or, or waffle based um, corrugated type mold to a two part one. Um, now, having gone through this process, we're thinking about uh, options where we can uh, multiply that more. So multiple pieces of, uh, of, of support structure can come in and meet and don't distort the mold in the assembly process. So this is just a quick overview of the, the uh, grasshopper skip, the script and the different portions of it as it has been. Um, there are a lot of uh, moving parts in a sense and, um, and a lot of points at which uh, you know, adjustments can be made, but we've been moving towards uh, a more and more, I'd say, user-friendly and universalized uh, script that can handle more or less whatever we give it, um, as long as it's a faceted object, and then produce something that we can take a good look at, and, and we have points at which we can adjust it. Um, the, the, uh, there is, so there is some operator control. Um, these are the portions of an uh, of an initial test block. This was just a, a the one that Jonathan showed earlier, um, and the assembly process, um, going through that to build the inner mold, then the outer mold, um, and then fit it into the the single sort of waffled uh, cradle. Um, next one, Laura. Um, and as we went through these more complex forms, you can see in this this example that we did go to a two part um, waffle structure, um, which had its own issues and we'll probably go to something even further, but uh, this is a good point to hand off to Jonathan because uh, he went through this this portion. Yeah, so um, Yeah, there was, you know, there, there's um, this um, Prototype that we've produced is really, you know, a, a great learning experience. So I'll just um, quickly go through the um, production of the or this early production. Um, Laura, can you turn to the next? So, what, one another thing we added to this process was um, just having a case, a reusable uh, light plywood case that we could put these objects in and um, uh, contain them a little better um, and also hold on to them. One, one of the issues we discovered that, that the corrugation really helps with the casting and, and holding the thing in place, but then flipping the, the mold over with all this casting slip is difficult. So uh, we had, we um, made these um, reusable cases. Um, next slide. And um, these are these are the um, we we fired um, to to um, cone six temperature and um, our, as you can see from this bright blue color we put um, uh, a cobalt oxide uh, engobe printed onto the onto the mold which is transferred onto the um, pieces and you can also see sort of laser etched lines where the folds are in the pieces so they kind of reiterate that. Um, Rhino, um, not Rhino file. Um, next slide. And I think one one of the um, interesting things here. This so so in in my mind, you know, we're one of the things we're dealing with and thinking is uh, how to um, how to improve the the um, accuracy and tolerances that we're working with. Uh, to get to get more reliable results, there is also to me an interesting thing that appears from this is just that the quality. Can we move to the next slide? Um, the quality of um, the paper and the quality of the mold transferring onto this, and so creating a new language, a new process is creating a new language of object uh, that you can't really achieve in other ways. Uh, and it's sort of unique to to the thing that you're making. So uh, we've been so busy thinking about the process. Really looking at these uh, results is interesting as well to think about um, those kind of that you know the connection between process and sort of that language. Um, and and one of the things, sort of going back to our original rationale behind this, um, I, just looking at um, now that we've made a prototype, um, you know about four hours time from from 
file to um, cast um, piece four or five hours from you know, an initial file to a cast piece as opposed to working with a plaster mold where uh, really uh, it takes days um, or, or even weeks to um, see a result from um, drawings. And a lot of hours of labor as well. So, Laura, do you want to take it from here? You're muted, Laura. Sorry about that. Um, so as we look at this process and where we have come to um, at this point, um, we are, um, we have pieces to be able to assess um, some changes that need to be made in order to create um, increased accuracy in the casting process. Um, and the, one of the main ones is tweaking the duration of the cast because the longer the, the wet slip is within, in the cast in its full um, sort of um, volume, the more pressure that is being put on the paper itself, um, but also it continues to absorb the water, so the paper continues to get wetter and wetter, um, which again messes potentially with the structure of the paper. So being able to um, optimize the slip composition for a faster molding process is something that we're very interested in pursuing in order to, um, as you saw on some of the earlier slides, um, sort of maintain the mold as dry as possible for as long as possible in order to keep the accuracy of that straight line that we are um, sort of aiming for in these tests. The other thing that we're looking at is seam adhesion and sealant on the mold itself. Some of the seams opened up, which creates some um, interesting aesthetic sort of um, conditions, but it is not the intention. So looking at new alternative ways of sealing corners um, is something that we are pursuing. Um, and improving the cradle itself for the more complex shapes. It needs more um, places to split and rejoin. Um, sorry. And um, then there's uh, digital automation. We need to increase efficiency in digital automation. Um, the mesh components faceting um, to make a planar solid um, need to move a little bit more efficiently. Um, the etching of the underglaze with control in 3D space is something that we're working on, but um, we were not able to um, sort of develop partially because we had some laser cutter issues in our lab um, with dust, but other laser cutters can handle that dust, so we are looking further into that. Um, and basically, a more efficient automatic layout of the laser cut on the sheets will also optimize our or reduce the time um, of human engagement. Um, and the last item is to develop greater cradle intelligence um, again, so that we, so that the cradle, the the parametric system develops um, the cradle with less um, human interaction and hopefully therefore less mistakes. Um, so just uh, in conclusion, I want to say thank you for um, the opportunity to show our work and share our work with you. Um, and I want to give a thanks, of course, to Boston Valley Terracotta for putting this amazing workshop together every year. Uh, but also to the University of Buffalo's um, SMART um, program, SMART lab program, um, where, which provided a fantastic C grant for this project to move forward with. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, 
we have um, um, maybe one question here that I think uh, you guys can maybe respond to. Uh, there's a question for the purpose of this exercise. Oh, sorry, there's, uh, I think Tim, you may have responded to this had to do with the symmetric versus asymmetric result uh, on shrinkage uh, on, on, on the process. Uh, is it possible to simulate the shrinkage process with some kind of computer simulation? I'm generally, I'm thinking slip casting, the um, shrinking is pretty even because the wall thickness is pretty even and the uh, mixture is mixed well. And so the slurry is, um, you know, there, there are deformations in shrinking of uh, slip cast that's more than uh, some other processes because of, um, yeah, because of, because of uh, more liquid in the, more liquid in the, uh, material, um, but there's also deformations in firing in ceramics and um, in other places in the process. There is a certain amount of tolerance you have to assume that um, uh, you can get from this process. Okay. Uh, super. Thank you very much. I think we're going to then go to the next group. Um, you can go ahead and, uh, Linda, start up your presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we are sharing a video presentation with all of you today to hopefully transport you to our studios in Toronto and Syracuse. Um, and we hope that uh, while the presentation is running, we might be able to have actually a parallel conversation with all of you in the chat. Um, so please feel free. We're a big team. Um, and we can all respond. Um, so please feel free to throw in any questions or comments um, that you might have. Uh, so I will get started. Um, Thank you all for joining us today. We are excited to be here and bring you on a virtual tour of our work. We are Haptech Lab, and we're pleased to present our work entitled Beyond the Surface, the Behavior of Digital Ceramics. In this project, Haptech Lab uses industrial robotic arms to push industrial ceramic manufacturing beyond the surface. So our work challenges the disconnect between digital fabrication and the haptic qualities of material behavior and develops a digital materiality based on tactile robotic feedback rooted in craft traditions. The team seen here is comprised of a consortium of artists, architects, technologists, interior designers, academics, and practitioners based in Toronto, New York, and California. We met throughout the year, sometimes in person, uh, but more recently mostly via Zoom. The largest co cohort of the team is based at Ryerson School of Interior Design, uh, and thankfully that group was permitted to return to the Ryerson Creative Technology Lab at FCAD around mid-July, where we've been continuing our physical studies, uh, and you can see that here in Zoom uh, with the robot in one of the screens. The team developed design research questions to establish parameters and expectations for our research on digital material behavior, asking, how can we translate the haptic qualities of handmaking via digital craft? And further, how can the material behavior of digital ceramics create new opportunities and possibilities beyond handmaking and beyond simply the performance optimization of handmaking effects? Drawing on our diverse backgrounds in both ceramic arts and fabrication craft, it was critically important for us to integrate robotic processes in a way that imbues the haptic qualities of handmade ceramics. The images scrolling on the screen are some of our studies, which we will discuss later in this presentation. In tackling this problem of translating haptic, emotive qualities into digital making, we looked at both ceramic arts and historical architectural ceramic projects, most of which were crafted by hand. Looking at the experience of architectural ceramics is really to understand the building skin as a surface that produces a phenomenological experience at two scales, the tactile scale and the optical scale. These interactions with the building surface are part of the urban experience, walking down a sidewalk or viewing a building across the street or a few blocks away. Our goal was to embed the surface with both detail at a small scale and narrative at a large scale to enable multiple readings at different points of view. 
In this chapel of souls in Porto, Portugal, for example, the individual tiles, each with incredible detail, aggregate together to create lively scenes. Across the street, we can more clearly see the stories of saints, lives depicted at the scale of rooms. Further away from the building, the details become textures in rich blues, which give depth to the building surfaces and vibrancy to the context. This phenomenon is one example of Leather Barrow's term surface architecture, which points to the building facade as an instrument of identity and engaging its surroundings. Simply put, building surfaces communicate. Harnessing this potential proved to be fertile grounds for us in this project, where we were asking questions about legibility and meaning, and ways to achieve these in architectural ceramics. Historical architectural ceramic projects ranging from those by Louis Sullivan to Ethos Bocchio demonstrate that clay is a productive medium for creating architectural effects, including color, texture, diffusion, and reflectance. Textures from rough to smooth can generate a sense of depth. In addition to architectural precedents, we also turn to those from ceramic arts to unpack qualities that engage the viewer haptically. Reflecting on these traditions, we began at the tactile scale by working with the clay by hand, looking at typical forms of making, like casting, stamping, molding, and bas relief, to create detailed ornamental tactility. Starting from the standard set of clay tools, we worked intuitively to produce haptic surfaces through multi layered textures. Recording manual manipulations of clay allowed us to observe the behavior of the terracotta clay body and record impressions made by human touch. Because of the density of the clay and the need for speed in the factory setting, we realized that the robot was a critical partner when scaling up haptic processes to industrial fabrication. Our next step was to transition towards recreating these haptic tactile experiences through the robotic arm. Here we can see our very first experiments with the robotic tooling on Boston Valley Terracotta's standard terracotta extrusions. We simply attached a ceramic hand tool to the end of the robotic arm to mimic hand marks. It became immediately clear that direct translation between the hand and the robot would need skill development in terms of operation, material behavior, and produced effects. At this stage, the robot was operated using manual controls to better understand the forces the robot exerted on the clay. The clay used in Boston Valley Terracotta's manufactured products is extremely dense, so the robot provides strength to manipulate it, up to 150 kilograms of force. However, because of its strength, it essentially treats the clay as a non-material. It carves through it without sensing how the clay is behaving, or even sensing that it is there at all. And so, we needed to develop a process to program craft and materiality into the tooling that teaches the robot to account for the behavior of the clay. We saw great potential in making use of the robotic arm in an industrial post-extrusion process which would develop a new kind of digitally tooled haptic experience. We found that layering impressions in the clay created a richer surface and chance material behavior. This is one of our first custom-made end effectors. The repetition and slight variation in terms of the tooling and the way we overlapped clay marks to create variations in material behavior, we st were starting to come close to developing craft skill in the robot to mimic our initial hand manipulations. We then simultaneously approached the project from another perspective, the optical distance. For this aspect, we worked with an image that could operate at an architectural or urban scale. Using an image from the archives of the Erie Canal Museum of Syracuse, we tested various ways the image could be made through impressions in the clay surface. Working with wet, unfired terracotta extrusions from the factory, we explored the use of common hand stamping tools, like these embossed 3D printed rollers. Multiple rollers were printed using variations of height field images wrapped on the roller surface. An array of 3D printed end effectors were designed and fabricated at various scales, lengths, widths, and depths in order to test the legibility and textual qualities of the impressions. One such exploration was the role of color in image legibility and haptic qualities. Applying terra sigillata allowed us to create layers of color, providing contrast and therefore legibility at various distances. We were also interested in the indexical relationship between clay, color, and the physicality of sites of extraction. We explored using clay from the banks that feed the Erie Canal to produce the terra sigillata. So the colors would reveal the materiality of the site itself in both a symbolic and embodied way. We then explored a variety of 3D printed rollers, differing in scale and geometry. Throughout the experimentation, we sought to create and test legibility of the image at varying distances. 
We found a depth limitation in this process. To be legible from afar, the ruler needs to be scaled proportionally in depth. This is not always possible within the thin surface of the extrusion panel, as we can see in this chart. We also explored different types of roller geometries, including those that would roll in a non-linear manner to produce surface tessellation patterns simply through rolling. This included an oloid roller, tricylinder rollers, and wobbly rollers, which are cylindrical rollers clipped at various angles to roll along a wave-like line. Ultimately, we found we were limited by the roller. As the image gets larger, it was difficult to embed the density of details required to produce tactile qualities at a haptic distance. What became evident is that the embossed roller method images seem to only work well when scaled at a single terracotta panel. When we tried to scale up the roller to produce an image across multiple panels, not only was this highly uneconomical in terms of roller material required, but also insufficient in terms of the legibility from afar and the haptic qualities from up close. Here we encountered a common problem of digital fabrication and design. Digital images can be infinitely detailed, but those nuances don't translate to clay in the same way. Clay doesn't always want to be digitally precise, and digital 3D modeling is unable to precisely simulate the behavior of clay. Instead, all materials are quasi-non-materials, materials who have no character and no behavior. Yet, clay deforms, its moisture shapes how it forms ridges and builds up, how it sticks to the tool or peels off. This unpredictability was precisely our interest in the digital process. And so we returned to some of our early tooling methods, learning from the pressure required to affect the surface topography. We fabricated a series of tools as extensions of the robotic arm. We found the more compelling textures to be those that suggested pointillist paintings and bas-relief sculptures, textures that are familiar and haptic. This type of craft sensibility allows us to move beyond the novelty of the robotic technology towards an artistic end, one of our team's primary goals. At the same time, we saw the potential for this method to produce a type of digital manufacturing economy. Any image or textual pattern could be programmed at the same cost using the same tools. With the robotic arm, the economy of production is no longer that of matrices, no longer finding economy by making numerous identical copies from molds or stamps. Instead, the logic of automation uses economy of movement, where each movement per second costs the same as any other movement. And with the capability of moving at a pace of 2.3 meters per second, programming custom images for robotic stippling had scalability potential. In our early attempts at using this method to create an image, the results fell flat, literally. Seen here in this image is a panel tooling of someone you might all know at ACOT 2017. This early test didn't leave room for a feedback loop between the digital design process and the material behavior that corresponds. Here the terracotta panel was still being treated like a non-material. Tooling was based on images produced in a grasshopper script, which assigned various diameters of circles based on light and shadow. This was directly applied as a tool depth to the clay surface using a tapered pick to make impressions. The resulting panel was not compelling materially, nor were the images even legible. And so we realized that we needed to stop trying to predict or control the outcome of the digitally tooled clay. Instead, like we did by hand, we started by simply making marks this time through various randomized computationally scripted points, just as an artist might repeatedly make the same action to see what might shake out. We also treated the digital process in the same way, developing a feedback loop between the haptic qualities produced rather than trying to make the clay conform to a premeditated image. We started from a series of densely packed gridded points and moved towards random seed generated points, varying both density, spacing, depth, and radii of marks. We also developed a five-sided tool making use of the six axes of movement of the robotic arm for continuous tooling of varying marks. In this way, with our robot collaborator, we began building skills over time with training in the form of altering programming and tools to exploit the central qualities of the resulting material effects and produce a feedback loop. Dense and overlapping marks, the scale of fingerprints, on slip colored clay created literal and phenomenological depth to the surface. We evaluated these surfaces based on surface qualities and textures, matte and gloss finishes, its potential to catch light, and how it might reflect its surrounding environment. In this regard, we were also interested 
in how these digital haptic terracotta surfaces might also interact with other reflective materials, namely glass. Reconsidering the tooled terracotta extrusion as a mold, a series of experiments were conducted at Corning Museum of Glass to explore how our digitally tooled surfaces might inform the behavior of molten glass. First, a cavity mold was created for a blown glass vessel. The tooled faces were set up to form a cavity and clamp tight and pre-coated with graphite release agent. A calibration tool was used to pre-size and pre-shape a molten glass bubble, which was then lowered into the cavity and blown using a blowpipe. The vessel was rolled, centered in shape, using the flame and the blowhole was cut off in cold working. Experiments were made with clear and colored glass to test optical effects of the pattern. Second, a press mold for cast glass was explored. A thick glass slab was cast into a steel frame. The tooled terracotta surface was pressed onto the glass slab for several seconds, then released. This generated a transferred pattern. Finally, a surface mold for set and press glass was tested. The thick glass slab was flipped onto the mold, allowed to set for a couple of seconds, and then pressed into the clay to pick up the tooling. As with our terracotta experiments, we hope to develop a feedback loop between the digital tooling of the terracotta panels, here used as molds, and the material behavior of glass. Our next step was to apply these sensibilities about digital materiality to a large-scale image with the goal of producing a surface that operates at both optical and haptic scales. Sampling the qualities of the most successful haptic surface tests, we assigned them to different regions within the image. In the final stages, we undertook a series of performance optimizations. Because of the robot's six axes of motion, you can have up to five tools on one end of arm tool and seamless changing between tools. We also calibrated the relationships amongst the impressions made by the larger tools in combination with detailing achieved by smaller tools to reduce tooling time and accelerate the process. Our KUKA robotic arm can move about 2.3 meters per second. Thus, our post-extrusion tooling procedure can easily keep up with the speed of industrial production especially when executed in full automation in a closed cell system. Multiple robots can also work side by side to produce an endless variety of images, patterns, and textures. Through careful design of the end effectors and its operations, our team was able to create highly dense textures at high speeds. Ultimately, we aim to produce an image that performs beyond the surface. This piece aims to be experienced not as a static image, but in motion relative to its viewers. As we move towards the image, the figure begins to fade as its tactile qualities become more vivid. In the spirit of this virtual conference, we hope to bring this experience to you through our VR exhibition at www.haptechlab.com, where we invite you to explore the one-to-one -one scale mock-up from a variety of distances. We also hope you will join us virtually in both the Creative Technology Labs at FCAT in Toronto at Ryerson University, as well as the Ceramic Studios at Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York, to see more of the processes, experimental failures, and successes of this project. If you are joining from home and have access to a VR headset, we invite you to click the icon on the top right-hand corner for a fully immersive VR experience. From a desktop or mobile browser, simply use the hotspots or the VR plan to navigate through the various virtual rooms. Ultimately, our process sets up the potential to integrate a new kind of digital craft into Boston Valley Terracotta's manufacturing pipeline, operating at speed in concert with the factory's production line and at sub-millimeter accuracy and repeatability. The robot becomes a critical partner in the manufacturing setting, offering the ability to create bespoke designs through an automated process, calibrated against digital craft and haptic feedback. This also offers the potential to be integrated with industrial manufacturing processes to make otherwise highly laborious detailing more widely accessible. Through programming and customized tooling, bespoke panels can easily be created without significant changes to the factory. We hope this process can unlock new possibilities for the craft of making within industrial ceramics production. In the next phase of this project, Haptech Lab aims to further develop this digital materiality at larger scales, exploring how designs translate across scales spatially as well as from the tactile to the scenographic. 
Finally, we would like to acknowledge funding support from Ryerson University and Syracuse University, as well as in-kind contributions from the Creative Technology Lab at FCAD, Boston Valley Terracotta, Corning Museum of Glass, the Ryerson Arsid 3D Material Studio and Ceramic Lab, the Ryerson Collaboratory, and the Syracuse University Ceramics Department. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. We hope we will have the opportunity to share this work with you in person one day and we're looking forward to the questions and discussion. Super, um, maybe you guys wanna unmute yourselves. Um, I do think we have a little bit of time here that we can take some questions. Um, so, um, maybe I can get some questions going. So at the moment, uh, I, I wanted to speak a little bit to this question of training. Uh, it was uh, basically just uh, spoken uh, about uh, in terms of how you're training um, uh, the robot and in terms of feedback and so forth. Could you just uh, speak a little bit more to what that is? Is it, is it just simply iterative processes that you're doing and, and just cataloging or is there actually some kind of uh, algorithm that's running into a kind of a training program uh, that you're following with with maybe a, a, some kind of AI or, or machine learning tools here. Yeah, so I think it's a, a combination of uh, both things. So we're trying to combine things that we might actually take from an artistic practice that might be kind of unconventional for what we would do um, in a digital practice. Uh, and so in the beginning with some of the results we were not so interested in, uh, we were kind of iterating through different uh, kind of scripted uh, forms of tooling or randomized tooling based on you know, functions or equations or random seed generated things to see kind of what would come out. Um, and it was too controlled. Uh, and so the kind of training is an idea of having a back and forth between, I think drilling is going to start in my unit uh, soon. So if you can't mm -hmm. hear me, I'm going to have my colleague jump in. They're doing uh, construction right now. Um, but essentially, uh, having a sort of back and forth between actually responding to what the clay is that has come out, which is something only the designer can perceive and look at. Um, and then essentially what finding uh, services that are generated that we, we sort of have deemed through kind of just testing um, as haptic and then t uh, keeping track of, you know, what were those points that were generated for those and basically making a data set out of those surfaces um, and their corresponding points and point depths and spacings um, and the tools that were used. And so you basically end up with a catalog um, of surfaces that have been through kind of uh, visual checking uh, deemed as haptic surfaces. And that catalog can then be programmed uh, by the robot and applied to different regions and used to produce images. But the kind of training is then a back and forth between something that would be perceived, um, you know, physically, tactilely, um, and then uh, defining those as points, point sets um, in the sort of digital programming space. One other question, just a, a, a little bit on the haptic side of, of the work. Um, uh, I imagine that um, the uh, one of the underlying currents here is just how to how to speed that haptics up uh, with the, with with the uh, robot, uh, but at the same time, the whole craft uh, effect really comes from a kind of slow hand or or a very determined hand. I'm just trying to see. Uh, do, uh, do you feel when you do look at these, um, even though they are, let's say, have a randomness quality to and stuff, do they still have a kind of very purposeful pressure that's always put down and 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 a feeling that somehow this is uh, artificial rather than hap uh, the haptic you would get from a, from a hand actually doing the same thing? I think what we were trying to achieve with the actual surface textures was something that looks like it could have been done by hand. And so one of the questions for us once, once we did achieve that was, okay, well, what's the point of the robot beyond just speeding up and digitizing an otherwise hand process? And for us, that was the interest with the precision of being able to produce an image um, and being able to specifically apply those textures to specific regions evenly across large scales. Um, and so that's sort of where our fascination with the robot as um, for architectural ceramics, I think becomes really exciting uh, because it would be very difficult to kind of achieve uh, that precision by hand across, you know, 20 meters um, of, of surface. But with the robot, it's, it's possible. Um, so we're, we're kind of 
uh, now moving into the phase of slowly scaling up and kind of testing that across larger and larger scales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, there are, uh, there's just some questions that I thought maybe, uh, what other hand ceramic techniques do you wish to the robot could do or could have? Oh, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I wish that the robot could sense the clay um, because the robot essentially, it will move through the clay or through me for the matter of fact, um, mm -hmm. with no consciousness that I'm there. It'll just throw me across the room if I you know, happen to be in its way. Um, and so I think it's, it's actually what, I, what would be amazing is, is for it to have a sort of um, kind of haptic uh, sense of the amount of pressure that's being applied and the force that kind of comes back, kind of built into a tool or a sensing um, object mm -hmm. so that it could start to uh, sort of respond to that on its own um, rather than, you know, in our system right now, uh, we are the ones who are kind of being um, its eyes for seeing what the clay is doing and then reteaching that into the digital space. Mm -hmm. uh, was there any uh, thought about the end effectors? Because I saw that it's a pretty complex end effector that you did sort of at the end have with the, uh, uh, with I guess the, the cones and other things, but could there be something in them uh, that uh, there's a, four sensors are being developed at Autodesk residency program for and it would be interesting to build these into the end arm tool. So yeah, perhaps it is maybe on this end effectors that could be a way to sort of, yeah, uh, condition that movement. Um, the, uh, just a little bit more, just on the end effectors, uh, how did you come up with, I mean, you started with actually literally taking the tools of the handcraft and then I think they began to become much more uh, rationalized. Uh, what was the kind of development there? Yeah, I think our, our earliest hand tools were, you know, uh, literally taking a block of, of wood and carving it down into a shape. Um, and then we, you know, 3D printed a series of, of end effectors that we thought would be interesting. Um, but the factors for us were kind of around um, what is the mark that it's making? And also when you repeatedly make the mark, how much clay does it pick up and how frequently do you have to clean that tool? So with the rollers, mm -hmm. you roll it once you need to clean it, you can't keep going. Um, and so in the end, we just developed these very, actually very simple um, kind of like, uh, like I would say like squished sphere um, kind of pokers essentially. Um, and they were smooth enough and their forms around enough that when they um, imprinted in the clay, they weren't picking up and building up clay. Um, as we continued, and those were all things we actually right. tested by hand first, um, before yeah. we kind of then uh, print, put them on the robot. Um, and then it was a matter then after that of calibrating, you know, with one poker, uh, you can sort of get the detailed image that you want, but it will take much longer. Yeah. And then, you know, if you add a one by three or if you add a, a three by three um, grid of them with the spacing of the gridding um, that allows for an overlap that has happy qualities, but also um, at what point do you sort of start to lose uh, the detail of the image. And so I think we started actually with kind of uh, like almost like five by five grids. And we quickly realized that uh, you could almost only really use them for a few points um, at the scale of the image that we were doing, which was around four foot by eight foot. Um, and otherwise uh, you couldn't kind of get the resolution uh, you would need. Uh, but it also means that as we scale up with images, we could continue to scale up uh, the grid of the end effector um, as you would need to kind of cover more area. So it kind of depends mm -hmm. on the amount of detailing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're just coming to the end. There's just one quick question about uh, your research group, uh, the Haptic Lab and uh, students and participation. Is there, um, is, is there some of that going on as well? How did you come up with your research group? Yeah, so um, it emerged probably um, as a dialogue between a lot of um, different individuals that we've all been in touch kind of around these topics before. Um, I had the pleasure of being able to attend the last, uh, I believe, three uh, ACA uh, workshops, um, which was such a pleasure. And while I was teaching at Syracuse University, met Errol Willett in the ceramic arts department. Um, who had also taught architectural ceramics with Claire Olson, uh, was also introduced to Naomi Frangos um, through her work uh, with slip casting glass. Um, so it was sort of uh, through um, a common interest on these topics. Um, and then we also have a student team uh, who have been, um, who this work would not be possible without. Um, so we have a student research team of, of three students, Amy, 
Gann, Georgia Barrington, and Rhys Young that are all uh, Ryerson University students that have been working uh, with us full time in the lab um, on this project. Super. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, and this sort of brings this panel uh, to a close. Um, I'd like to, to, to thank um, both teams for um, uh, pushing the boundaries in some ways of uh, how we're thinking about this material, uh, moving between craft, digital techniques, and, and uh, digital practices. 